Hey everybody. Hey, it was just a week or two ago I read this book by Rob Dreher and did a little reaction to it. And somewhere in the footnotes, always read the footnotes, uh, I came upon this guy, Rizard Legutko, and he is dealing with the demon in democracy. Now, let me just start off with the flavor for it. Communism and liberal democracy proved to be all unifying entities, compelling their followers how to think, what to do, how to evaluate events, what to dream, and what language to use. They both had their orthodoxies and their models of an ideal citizen. And Legutko's book is about the similarities between liberal democracy and communism. Legutko is from Poland, and of course you realize that when communism fell, uh, there was he was in the eastern portion there, and they switched from communism to Western liberal democracy. So he's coming from a very unique angle, and this is one of the more chilling books I've read in a long time. Uh, kind of a surprise, interesting things here in the book. Let me throw you a few, I'm just going to read a few excerpts and comment on them. Uh, he's talking about, again, the commonalities between liberalism and, or liberal democracy and communism. So... <laughs> Probably something some of us haven't ever thought about, but get a load of some of these things. For example, both regimes clearly distanced themselves from the past. Both embraced the idea of progress with all of its consequences. These are totalizing viewpoints, worldviews. He has uh, chapters here on history, utopia, politics, ideology, and religion, and they're all quite interesting. Uh, I'm going to just grab bits and pieces here to give you the flavor. Listen to this from page 38. The communists attempted to mold a communist man to fit the institution and logic of the communist system, but suffered defeat. But where they failed, the liberal democrats proved successful. If ever any system existed that was perfectly tailored to the aspirations of the people inhabiting it, it was liberal democracy, and if ever any human model existed that was perfectly tailored to opportunities offered by the political system and to the aspirations enhanced by it, it was a liberal democratic man. So he says where the communists failed in most of their goals, liberal democracy achieved most of the same goals the communists were trying to get. Yeah, now put your brain around this one. Uh, Legutko on page 43 says, both communism and liberal democracy are perceived from an inside perspective as having no alternatives. So again, it's, it's, the total end point is going to be communism, the total end point is going to be liberal democracy. They're, they're all or nothing um, approaches to how you do things. Here's a paragraph on page 45. Liberal democracy boasts of bestowing freedom on individuals and emancipation on groups while simultaneously taking it for granted that freedom and emancipation are possible only in a liberal democracy, or rather that freedom and emancipation are liberal democracy. Over time, the mind of a liberal democrat began to resemble that of a socialist, exhibiting the same tendency to combine the languages of morality and politics as no other discourse could possibly do justice to the nature of the system. That's interesting, combining the language of morality and politics, and today what do we have? The total politicization of virtually everything here in the West. Everything's politicized, and when you deal with something, it's basically felt to have a moral tone. It's, every question is a moral question. It's all or nothing. Page 62, the liberal democratic state, still more effective than a communist state slowly and steadily underwent a similar expansion and likewise deeply intruded into the lives of its citizens. However, while the communist states spread and intrusive interference had their source in the determination of the authorities who, in order to survive, had to impose forcefully more and more controls of social spontaneity, in a liberal democratic state, the source of this growing intrusion was the citizens themselves, both as individuals and as members of the privilege-seeking groups. So he says that under communism, the state pressed people down and forced things to go its way, whereas here, here in um, modern day, present day, the West, it's the force of the people themselves are forcing and forcing a certain conformity on each other. He's right. On page 77, liberalism is primarily a doctrine of power, both self-regarding and other-regarding. It aims to limit the power of other agents and at the same time grants enormous prerogatives for itself. In a sense, it is a super theory of society, logically prior to and by its own declaration of self-importance, higher than any other. So what you've got is a super theory. You're going to speak against democracy? Good luck with that. How's that going to play out? 
In his book, Leguko argues that, you know, we started with this blending of republicanism and democracy and that over time the Republican part has kind of fallen out and the democracy part has ascended to, the, to take over everything. Okay, here's page 92-93. Just as communism was not possible with families adhering to the feudal patriarchal system, so liberal democracy is believed to be incomplete and unsuccessful with schools respecting traditional moral and cultural authoritarianism. The arguments are analogous. Just as a person coming from a non-communist community could not become a full-fledged, dedicated, and efficient citizen of the communist state, so a graduate of a traditional school will never be a faithful and reliable citizen of the liberal democratic state. Yeah, we see some of that attitude around here too. You've got to go to the big university and, and we've got to weed out all that, all that old stuff, all that old religion and traditional stuff. In his section on politics, he writes this, when the state takes over responsibility for the rules of cooperation and their enforcement on all layers of society, there will be no limits to its interference in people's lives. Isn't that true? The more time goes on, the more intricate and the more uh, deeply the state reaches down and wants to regulate everything that we're doing. This is kind of the, uh, what happens as, as liberal democracy matures, says Legutko. How do marriage, how do marriage and the family uh, come out with this stuff? Page 106, 107. Indeed, after the October Revolution in 1917, sexual life was set free with sadly predictable results. He goes on to say, Despite the occasional tide changes, divorce and abortion ultimately became the leading achievements of the new political system, and in this regard, communism was far ahead of the liberal West. For the real great sexual revolution, the West had to wait until the 60s of the 20th century. What happened then was, in terms of scope and content, far more radical than anything in the past. Its consequences, unpredicted during the revolution itself, continued to unfold themselves before our eyes, even today, and will most likely continue in the years to come. This revolution combined two things. First, it repeated the old communist plan to overthrow the repressive power structures, including marriage and family. This time, however, and that was what made it different from previous revolutions, its slogans of sexual liberation mobilized millions of people and it had at its disposal previously unheard of instruments of ideological warfare, notably mass culture and mass media. Yeah, that's true. That's true, too. On page 108, he uh, talks about this conflation between happiness and pleasure. We exchanged a plan to be happy for a plan to experience pleasure. Happiness, of course, takes time and, and a lot of responsibility. Uh, pleasure just takes a moment. And so there's kind of a, a continual degradation of society that's, that uh, he notices. And he noticed it in Poland after after they went from communism to the West. By the way, you know, he's, he's not saying, let's go back to communism, not at all, not at all. Um, but he doesn't like the similarities of the hard and bad things. Let me give an extended comment from page 127 on, uh, under the chapter on ideology, on what he's talking about, about language. You'll find this to be very current. One of the most unpleasant aspects of living under communism was an awareness that we were always surrounded by non-reality, that is, artifacts fabricated by the propaganda machine, whose aim was to prevent us from seeing reality as it was. Down the page now. All these terms and many others, impossible to translate into English, were supposed to describe real facts, processes, and institutions, but were actually political declarations. It was impossible to conduct any serious debate about the real issues because the language served to conceal rather than to reveal. Whoever used those keywords automatically gave his consent to this function of the language and agreed to take the role of participant in a linguistic political ritual and thereby to declare his loyalty. And then he says, the first step in breaking loyalty was to abandon this language in order to see the world as it was without the mediation of fraudulent words or the false hypostases they generated. Yeah, and that's what we have today right here in the West. Exactly. He, he's nailed it completely. We have language being used. Uh, it's all just being used for propaganda. And when you agree to their wording, you're, you're pretty much uh, in trouble, you know? When did you stop beating your wife? You know, that kind of thing. Well, we hear, we hear a lot today about equality. And I, he t mentions what's called the paradox of equality. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, you'll never forget it. Here it is. The more equality one wants to introduce, the more power one must have. The more power one has, the more one violates the principle of equality. The more one violates the principle of equality, the more one is in a position to make the world egalitarian. And that's the paradox of equality. The harder, the more force you use to make things equal, the more you're exactly contradicting the principle you're supposedly upholding. 
there's a lot about ideology here. And this sentence, I think, really nails some things down. Once a man joins an ideological group, all becomes clear to him and everything falls into place. Everything is either right or wrong, correct or incorrect, and this perception soon changes the man himself. In other words, what you are, who you are, the character you form is going to change based on the kind of social structure you're living in. Communism, liberal democracy, uh, dictatorship, etc. figure it out. It's all going to have its effect on us, and so uh, from a Christian standpoint, we need to be awake, alert, and we need to be ready to resist things that are, that are just exactly contrary to the principles that, that we believe are true. Still in the chapter on ideology, page 138, both sides, communist and liberal democratic, share their dislikes, sometimes bordering on hatred toward the same enemies, the church and religion, the nation, classical metaphysics, moral conservatism, and the family. Both are unable to mitigate their arrogance toward everything that their ideology despises and which, in their revolutionary ardor, they seek to remove from the public space and from private lives. And he says this, in every sentence from the Leninist and Stalinist catechisms, one can replace proletariat with women or with homosexuals, make few other minor adjustments, and no one will recognize the original source. Both sides desire a better world so badly that in order to have it, they do not hesitate to control the totality of human life, including these aspects that are the most personal or intimate. And that seems to be what we are experiencing today. And I think I've saved the best for last, this uh, rather long paragraph from near the end of the book, page 167. Here it is, flat out. If the old communists live long enough to see the world of today, they would be devastated by the contrast between how little they themselves had managed to achieve in their anti-religious war and how successful the liberal democrats have been. All the objectives the communists set for themselves and which they pursued with savage brutality were achieved by the liberal democrats who almost without any effort and simply by allowing people to drift along with the flow of modernity succeeded in converting churches into museums, restaurants, and public buildings, secularizing entire societies, making secularism the militant ideology, pushing religion to the sidelines, pressing the clergy into docility, and inspiring powerful mass culture with a strong anti-religious bias in which a priest must be either a liberal challenging the church or a disgusting villain. Is not, one may wonder, this non-religious and anti-religious reality of today's Western world very close to the vision of the future without religion that the communists were so excited about and which, despite the millions of human lives sacrificed on the altar of progress, failed to materialize. Think about that one for a while. And so, is there a demon in democracy? You know, it's hard not to think that he's, he's on to something there. I don't see republicanism emphasized. Even the Constitution has changed from states' rights and the people's rights to basically a single unitary state, everything pressed down from the government. You know, they're going to tell you whether there's going to be restrictions on you because of COVID. They're going to tell you whether there's going to be restrictions on you, whether you can travel or not, whether you have to wear a mask or not, and so on. Yeah, this, this is not the same stuff. This is not the country we started with. So this book is from 2016. I mean, this is like five years uh, before now, and yet it's describing our world today. I mean, just, just very precisely. You know, it's a translation from Polish into English, and so uh, it's, it's a little bit thick reading in some places. But uh, I'm finding that the insights from it are, are very useful today. What the way out of it is, I don't know. I know we need to be faithful to God, those of us that are Christians, but it looks like we're in for a, a rough ride, and they were in for a pretty rough ride under hard communism. We're in for a pretty rough ride under hard liberalism. So, little reaction to his book, The Demon and Democracy. Sadly, good points.